Today, we're going to begin a brand new series of messages. It's been a long time since I've really gotten exegetical and preached verse by verse, line by line, and we're going to do that over the next several weeks. We're going to go through the book of Philippians. So if you have your Bible, turn over to with me to the book of Philippians, and this series we're going to title, Imitate. The Apostle Paul says, if you see anything good in me, if you see anything good in us, imitate it. And Paul's not saying I'm Jesus. Paul is saying I've chosen in my life to imitate Jesus. Therefore, I want you to imitate what we're doing. Okay, I want to I just make this very clear to you when we talk about imitating the Lord. Again, I want you to imitate Jesus. But have you ever met someone who is just so close to Jesus, they just love the Lord, they just fell in love with the Lord. And you looked at them and you thought, there's some character traits in them that I wish I had in me. Have you ever had people like that around you that you just thought, man, and I'm, I'm very fortunate to have some men that are surrounding my life that I look at and I look up to. And I look at them and I go, there's, some, there's the way they think, the way they act, the way they treat other people. I think to myself, I, I want to be, I want to be like that. And it's not that I'm wanting to be like them, it's I want to be like the Jesus that lives in them. Does that make sense? And so we, if there's any good way found, let's imitate that because we want to be more like Jesus. Now, to talk about Philippi, I want to set this up a little bit before we get there. Philippi is in a land or a region known as Macedonia. You may remember in Acts chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says that he had a vision of a man who said to him in the vision, come over here. Remember that? And so the apostle Paul put it in his heart to be able to go to Macedonia to preach the gospel to them because of a vision that God gave him to go and preach the gospel. When he arrives, one of the first places that he arrived at in Macedonia was this little community known as Philippi. And so uh, in Philippi, you may remember, they get in there, they begin to preach the gospel, and there were people, there were actually, uh, there were townspeople, there were, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the terminology, there were city councilmen, and there were mayors, and there were officials who hated the gospel, they hated the word that they were bringing, so they threw Paul into prison, you may remember the story. And so rather than Paul getting all upset and been out of shape because he was unjustly in prison, they decided to have a worship service in jail. And they began to have a concert and they began to worship. And the concert was so strong and was so powerful that they literally brought the walls down. They brought the house down in the prison they were. You may remember there was a great earthquake as they worshiped God and the prison doors flung open, but this was no ordinary earthquake because not only did the doors fling open and the walls fall down, but the Bible tells us that the chains fell off of them. Now, that's some kind of earthquake you got there, right? So this is a Holy Spirit shaking that was going on. The, 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 uh, uh, the guy who was in charge of the prison comes out and he sees that the prison walls are down and he figures that all the prisoners have completely escaped. And so he thinks to himself, Tomorrow, when the Romans get here, it was my responsibility to make sure that none of these prisoners escaped. And if in the Roman days, if, if one single prisoner escaped, the prison, the, the guy in charge of the prison, uh, the, he was actually, would be tortured and killed because he allowed a prisoner to escape. And so he figured that the next day the torture would begin. So he decided he was going to commit suicide. And at the very moment before he killed himself, the apostle Paul cries out to him and says, don't harm yourself. We're all still here. Here's what, he's, here's what the apostle Paul was saying. We've had such a good worship service. There was no reason to run. We thought we'd just stick around for a little while. And, the, and the, the guardian of the prison said, couldn't believe that all the prisoners would stay there and wait because they had such an amazing service that night. He invited Paul and the prisoners to his home. He fed them. Paul led the entire household to Christ. And sometimes when we think household, we think of husband, wife, children, maybe an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent who was living there. But listen, when he said household, he was talking about even the soldiers who were there guarding the prison. So the church at Philippi began in a prison and the guards and the, and the, and the keepers of the prison and the households of those guards were the first church members at Philippi. 
So when Paul goes to address them, he's addressing all of these people who are there. And then when Paul goes to write this letter to the Philippian church, he's no longer in prison in Philippi. Now he's in Rome in prison. And so again, I don't know why we get this idea that if you live a Christian life, you're never going to have trouble. It's actually the very opposite of that. So, you know, I know this is an encouraging message. Come to Jesus and you will be tortured. So anyway, <laughs> but here's what I want you to understand. We, we, we expect to n- have nothing go wrong when the reality is things go wrong in life. It's just the way that things are. And maybe even more so for us who are believers. And so Paul is in prison in Rome, and the Bible actually tells us this. It says that they went into the initial trial when he got there. Uh, the person who was in charge of the trial basically said, hey, listen, we're going to set a trial date for such a time. For two years, Paul was sent to live on his own under the guardianship of the Roman soldiers. And so we pick up that, we find that story in Acts chapter 28. It says, when he entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. And so this verse doesn't say this, but we understand what actually took place. So when you're under the guardianship of a Roman soldier, you would sometimes, they would think, this, is, this, this crime does not merit being in a prison. We'll send you to your house and we'll send a Roman soldier to your house and he will stay with you. And here's what we know in Roman days, they would have a chain that would be uh, attached to the Roman soldier and that chain would be attached to Paul. And Paul couldn't get any further than six to seven foot from that Roman soldier at any given time. So he had a certain amount of freedom because he's living in his own home. But three times a day, they would change out that guard. And so for eight hours, that guard would be with him, and then they'd put a new guard with him, and then they would put a new guard with him. So three different soldiers every day. And, and when, you know, some of us would be like, this is terrible, this is awful, why would God let me go through this? You know what Paul did? He, go, he went, praise God, I've got a captive audience. <laughs> and so when Paul says, many in the household of Caesar have come to know him as Savior, what he's saying is, I had a captive audience, I led a lot of people to Jesus. Three times a day, I had someone new chained to me. And and by the way, why don't we just look at our circumstances and say, you know, some of you are like, well, I don't like the job I have. How about we look at it as an opportunity to to give Jesus to somebody? Or "I I don't like my neighbors that I've got. How about we give that as an opportunity to give Jesus to somebody? I mean, even grumpy neighbors need Jesus. Come on, people. You know that's good. Some of y'all live in grumpy neighborhoods. And I'm just, and some of you live with grumpy people. Don't point fingers, don't point fingers. (laughs) Pastor David is available for marriage counseling. Anyway, so (laughs) how about we realize that God has given us an opportunity right in front of us. And so Paul has chosen to take his opportunity with with the situation that God has placed within him rather than pout, rather than souring, rather than just soaking in his misery. Paul said, this is an opportunity to win people to Jesus. I think that's the attitude that we ought to have in our life. So I want to give you today, as we get to Philippians chapter 1 now, I want to give you today seven distinctives of a Christian. Seven things that are distinctive of us as believers. I want to start with this. Uh, Number one, our Christian address. Uh, Every one of us have an address. Every one of us. And I'm not talking about your email address, but I'm talking about your location. Every one of us have an address. Paul addressed the Philippian church this way. He said, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus. By the way, you know, how many of you have ever received a letter that was three, four pages long and you had to flip to the end of the letter so that you could see who it was that wrote it? Okay, uh, in the Bible, oftentimes, they tell us who wrote it at the beginning. So it says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus. And I want you to notice these words. It's very important. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, including the oversight overseers and the deacons. So uh, let me kind of break that down a little bit. First of all, we're going to see when we get towards the end of this uh, book, we're going to see that there were two women that were in the church that were fighting. They didn't like each other and they were causing a, a ruckus in the church. I want you to see who this letter is to. This letter is not to those who are in right standing with the church. This letter is to all 
the saints. Some of those saints were not doing the right thing. Some of those saints were living in immorality. Some of those saints had idolatry going on. Some of those saints had arguments going on. Paul says, I'm writing this letter to all of you. And then he says, and I want to include into this letter overseers and deacons. And again, uh, deacon, the, the term deacon, there is a position in the church known as a deacon. But in this context, Paul is not referring to a governmental position within the church. He's saying to the overseers, to the bishops, to the pastors, and to the deacons. What's a deacon? A deacon is someone who works in the church. Now, at Life Fellowship, we don't actually use the term deacon in our church. It's just not a term. There's some reasons why. I don't have time to go into it. But we look at workers. So let me me help you with this. How many of you are in this room this morning... You're on the dream team at Life Fellowship. Can I see your hand real quick? Look at all those deacons. Look at all those workers for Christ. Okay, listen to me. He says, to all the saints and to the pastors and to all the workers, people who are working in the church, I've got something that I want to say to you. I want to address to you. So let me me change this just a little bit. Do you realize there are four major life positions that govern every Christian's life. There are four major positions that we go through. So if you're a believer, these positions are positions that either you've gone through or you're headed towards, okay? So the first position is uh, when we were without Christ. I want you just to think about this. I had someone one time, I was talking to uh, this couple, married couple, and I said to them, tell me about when it was that you first met Jesus. And their statement back to me was, well, we've always known him. Okay, not true. (laughs) So what a lot of us get caught in the trap of believing is, well, mom and daddy were Christians, so therefore I'm a Christian, so therefore I've always known Christ. No, listen to me. Uh, We are all born sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. And there was a time when we all were without Jesus in our life. And if you tell me I've always known him, then I would say this to you, you've never known him. I know that's hard language for some of you. You're like, wait a minute, what? No, I'm telling you, if you have not had a moment where you have met him, let me challenge you, you need a moment where you meet Jesus. Because we were all at some point without Christ. The second thing that is common to all of us as believers is uh, then we went from without Christ to being in Christ. Okay, this, this, is, this is really great. When we believe in the name of Jesus and put faith in him, in that moment, we go from being without him to not just being in him or not just being with him, but now being in him. We're literally, our lives are being kept in Jesus Christ, our Savior, Every one of us, this is a position that is common to every believer, that we come to the place where we say, God, I need you, and he says, now we're family. Now we belong to one another. I belong to you, and you belong to me. We move to the place of being in Jesus Christ. The third position is uh, that we, uh, we start working for Christ. And by the way, don't get this backwards. Many people think, Well, if I am good enough and if I work hard enough, he'll let me in to Christ. Well, it doesn't work that way. For it is by grace that you're saved, by faith, not of works. Works can't get you saved. But once you're in Jesus, we begin to work. Why? Why do I begin to work? Because why would God love me so much that I would dedicate my life for him to be my master, my savior, my Lord? Why would I not want to serve him? I serve him not because it saves me. I serve him because he saved me. And by the way, this is the position that every Christian needs to move into. If if you were merely saved, you need to mature in your faith and learn to serve the Lord. Listen, serving is literally going, I'm so thankful that he would even allow me in. That I want to serve him. Not because it saves me, but because he's my Lord now. Do do y'all get that? So we all move to this position. And the final position, the final position, none of us have experienced yet. And that would be, one day, we shall be with Christ. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, my dad in 2005 went to be with Jesus. My dad has gone through all four of these. There was a time he was without. There was a time that he was in. There was a time he began to serve. And now there's a time where he is with Christ eternally. One day we're all going to be with Christ. I don't know what that's going to look like. I'm kind of hoping, I don't know how, yours, how you feel about it. I'm kind of hoping that when I go to be with Christ, I don't have to go through death. I'm kind of hoping that the rapture occurs and he calls me home. Someone says, oh, so you believe that your position is premillennial, pre-tribulational position. Well, I think it's the best position of all of them. But <laughs> here's, my, here's my opinion, okay? Here's my opinion on that. I, I do believe I'm a pan-millennialist. I don't know exactly how it's all going to turn out, but I think it'll all pan out in the end. Here's how I wish Jesus would do it. He's not going to do it this way, but I wish he would do it this way. He just let you go when you believe it is. I believe it's going to be pre, you go when you want. Isn't it funny how we'll all all of a sudden become pre-tribulational at that moment, right? And so I don't know when, I don't know when that's going to be. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I hope I pray, wouldn't it be cool to be the last generation before the return of Christ? And I don't know if it is or not, but I'm excited about it. I'm praying for it. My dad always believed it would be his generation. It wasn't. I'm believing it'll be my generation. How about you? Would you like it for to be your generation? I can't wait to see what Jesus is going to do. And so listen, that's going to be our address. I want you to think about the Christian address. So the Christian address is real simple. Think about it like this. Uh, right now, we're living, if Paul was to address this to us, he would say to all the Christians who are in East Texas. That's how Paul would address it. But listen to me, ultimately, he could say it like this, uh, to all Christians who one day will spend eternity with their address in heaven. Because this world is not our home. This is not our permanent address. We're just renting. We're just passing through. But one day, we'll be with him. Have you ever thought about what makes heaven heaven? A lot of people think, you know, well, heaven's heaven because it'll have streets of gold. That's going to be fun to see. But that's not what makes heaven heaven. Uh, some people are like, well, I can't wait to see them pearly gates. <clears throat> uh, how, big a, how big an oyster do you have to have to have gates made of pearl? <laughs> you know? That's going to be fun to see. But do you know that's not what makes heaven heaven? Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the sea of glass. I think it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge, to be honest with you, because I don't know how you fish a sea of glass, but I'm gonna work on it when I get there. But what makes heaven is not a sea of glass. What makes heaven heaven is Jesus will be there. That's what makes heaven, and we'll be there together, and we'll like each other. It's gonna be fun. So that's the Christian address. Here's the second thing. And I've got to move because I've got seven of these and I'm only hit one. So here's number two. Christian atmosphere. Have you ever thought about the atmosphere of what it means to be a Christian? Galatians chapter, or excuse me, Philippians chapter one, verse two says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I read that uh, this week as I was studying and it just dawned on me that this is the atmosphere. Um, I want, I want all of you to do something with me real quick. All right, do this real quick. I want every one of you to take a deep breath. Everyone take a deep breath. Ready? Okay, let it out. Okay, you just breathed atmosphere. As a human being, we breathe in oxygen, nitrogen, right? That's atmosphere. And when we exhale, we exhale carbon dioxide. Is that right? Come on, science people. Okay. Have you ever thought about, though, as a Christian, there's an atmosphere as a believer that we breathe in and an atmosphere that we breathe out? And this hit me as I was reading this. Grace is something that we do not deserve. Listen, you ought to, every moment of every day, thank God for his grace Grace is getting God's riches at Christ's expense. It is getting something good that you never deserve to get in on. Every moment for the believer, we should be breathing in the grace of God. Uh, don't raise your hand. How many of you did something this week that you should not have done? Don't raise your hand. I don't want to know. I am not your priest. We are all priests. 
You can go to the Lord and confess it. How's that? All right? Because you're a kingdom priest. Okay, every moment. You, listen, many of us don't experience peace because we're not letting the grace of God through. We need to be breathing in God's grace every day. God, thank you for your grace. God, thank you that you love me so much. Listen, it's grace that you even get to breathe oxygen today. It's grace. Uh, it's grace that you get to be married to the person that you're married to. Some of you are like, you don't know my spouse. No, it really is. It's God's grace because God wants to do something in your marriage that only he can do. And it's his grace allowing you to be in that circumstance that he might change the atmosphere in your home. So grace, we should be breathing in grace all the time. But here's the cool thing. When you exhale, you exhale carbon dioxide. But as a believer, if you're inhaling enough grace, peace will come through. Now, listen, let me say something about peace. Many of you would think about peace. Here's what we think. Peace means I have no troubles. That's not what peace means. The Bible says it like this, that we might have the peace that passes understanding. In other words, sometimes we're going to go through hard times. The world ought to look over and go, how does that person have so much peace going through all the trouble that they have? Peace is having rest in the midst of trouble. It's being able to go through hard times and go, you know what? Thank you for your grace, God, and breathing out, and I'm going to live in your rest and your peace no matter what's happening in my life. Isn't that great? That's the atmosphere for a believer, breathing in grace and breathing out peace wherever we go. Listen, I'm going to say it another way. Every place we go, peace ought to trail us. In other words, our, our coworkers ought to know that we have peace around us all the time. How can you have that kind of peace that passes all understanding only because I've understood the grace of God in my life and I understand the grace of God for your life too? Is that good? That's the Christian atmosphere. Here's the third thing, and that is Christian associates. Now, I, I truly believe that every believer ought to have some friends. And I believe that's really what church is really for. And it's what I think that life groups are for, that we can have associates, friends. Here's how the Apostle Paul addresses that, verse 3. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Paul is sitting there in, in prison in his home, chained to a soldier. And he goes, I'm sitting here thinking about those who are in Philippi. And I, I'm so thankful to God for all of you. I'm thankful for all of you who got saved while I was in prison. I'm so thankful for the household of faith. I'm so thankful. By the way, there were some, you know, there were some uh, annoying people. And Paul says, I'm so thankful for even you annoying people. And he goes on to say this, always offering prayers with joy in my every prayer for you all. Now this little phrase, you all, Paul repeats over and over again throughout the book of Philippians. There are some people who've said they were pretty sure the apostle Paul was a southerner. <laughs> but what he's saying is, I just fell in love with you so much. Even those of you who are a little annoying, I thank God for you every moment. And I'm filled with joy when I think of you, all of you, when I pray for you. And then here's verse five that's really important. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. And I want you to pick up on that last word there that he says, the participation. I'm so thankful to have friends who are participating with me. I'm so thankful for some people who are choosing to go through this with me. Uh, I get a little suspicious of people, and by the way, this is happening more and more today. I'm suspicious of people who say, I don't really need the church. I don't really need to be in church. I don't have to go to church. I can watch this online. Hey, no offense to you online, but hey, I get a little suspicious of you. Because the Bible says that we should be, as we see the day approaching, and I don't know about you, I'm seeing the day approach, we should more and more assemble ourselves together. In other words, and then it says, and we shouldn't forsake the assembling together of ourselves. There is something that happens in the body of Christ that cannot happen in your home. A few weeks ago, many of you know, I had the flu, and uh, I spared you and did not come in. Are y'all thankful today? I just want to know. 
some of you got it anyway. And some, you know, I've had some friends that right now are have in the midst of the flu. But I remember sitting at home. I didn't want to miss church. I love the church. I hate being away from the church. I hate being away from the church so much that even when I go on vacation, I find a church to go to be a part of. But that day, I couldn't be in church, so I had to watch church online. And we have a good one. We have a good service. But here's what I want to tell you. To be honest with you, I did my very best ability to try and worship in my living room, on my couch, and it ain't the same. I'm just being honest, it's not the same. Man, this morning we're in here and we're singing those songs and I'm with my brothers and sisters in Christ. You're, you're singing out and you're clapping and you're raising your hands so encouraged me this morning. You know what it did? It drove me to wanna to be a greater worshiper before the Lord. And so I wanna just say this to you very clearly, that we need friends. We need family around us. It drives us to be more like Jesus. It drives us to imitate who Christ is. Let me say this a different way. The Jesus that's in you drives me to want to imitate every one of you. So we need friends. I'm so grateful for life groups where I can go and be around brothers and sisters and just be myself for a little while. And I hope at life group, as you're spending some time in the word, I hope you'll have a little bit of that. And I hope that you'll take some time, that you'll break some bread together and maybe not casserole, but I hope you'll break some bread together when you're together. And, and, I, and I hope that you spend some time in prayer together. But you know what I really hope? I hope that you'll discover that you got some people who will stick closer than a brother with you, who will love you, who will care for you, who will be there in your hard times in life. We need some Christian associates in our life. We need some Christian friends in our life. Here's the fourth thing. And again, these are distinctives of Christians. Christians have friends. The world has acquaintances. But we have real friends because our friends are brothers. And when someone says, how can we be brothers? Let me say it another word, we're blood brothers, bought with the blood of Jesus. It's good news. So Christian associates, here's number four, Christian assurance. We need Christian assurance in our life. By the way, there is an assurance about faith. We really do. We need to have an assurance that when Jesus saved us, he saved us. You need the assurance to know that he's not gonna leave you, that he's not gonna forsake you. But I like what the Apostle Paul says in verse six. He says, I am confident of this very thing. What's the very thing? That he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Let me say that a little bit different way. Uh, God is in a work in Mark Allen's life. The thing that God began in me, he is working to perfect in me. Let me say it a different way. I am not the man today that I used to be. Uh, some of you, I'm glad you don't, some of you don't know the old Mark. I really do. I, I think I was a much angrier. Uh, I think I was, uh, I think I had a real lack of humility and a, a lot of arrogance in my life. Let me just say this to you. I am not that man any longer. Someone says, well, have you arrived? I don't think so. Because I think, that he who began a good work in me is still working to perfect it in me. Let me say this a different way. The Apostle Paul, who's saying this of those people in Philippi, and there were some annoying people there. There were some women who were annoying in that church, who could not get along in that church. What the Apostle Paul is saying, I can see where you are now, but I can also love you because of where he's going to take you. You don't have to remain the same. And, and by the way, this is how we learn how to love one another. We need to get to the place where we stop seeing them for the way they are right now. Because <clears throat> how many of you know someone annoying? Let me see your hand. Don't point, don't point, don't point. They're right beside you, don't point. <laughs> we have to stop seeing them as how they are now and we need to start seeing them like the Apostle Paul saw. I'm confident the God who began a good work in you will perfect it. I wanna see you for how you're going to become in your life. Listen, some of you wives, this would be a really good thing to take on because some of you are like, oh, I just don't think my husband's perfect. Well, he's not. Neither are you. But listen, I got great news for you. You ought to start praying, God, help me to see my husband for the man that you're gonna make him. And some of you husbands ought to pray over your wife. God, I thank you for the woman that you're going to make my wife because I'm confident the God who began a good work in them will perfect it. And God, do it in me too. Would that be pretty good? You think that might help a marriage a little bit? 
So this is the Apostle Paul saying, we ought to have this kind of assurance. Here's number five. We ought to have Christian affection for one another. Uh, we ought to learn how to love one another. We all know the great command, right? The greatest of all the commands is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then Jesus goes on to say, and the second is like the first, that we should love others in the same way that we already love ourselves. And so we ought to learn how to love one another. This is a Christian distinctive that we have. Philippians chapter one, verse seven says, for it is only right for me to feel this way about you all. I feel about, there it is again, there's that Southern term, you all. He says, I, I, he, goes, I, I, he goes, it's only right that I do this. It's only right that I feel this way, knowing that God's gonna perfect you because, Paul says, I have you in my heart. Listen to me. Every one of you, there's something about you that God has placed within my heart. And hopefully there's something about each other that we have in our hearts with one another. I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all partakers are partakers of grace with me. There's that Southern term again. In other words, I know that even though you're not in this prison, that you're contending for me. You're caring for me. You're loving me. You're affectionate towards me. And verse eight says, for God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Someone says, but pastor, how do, how do you love someone who's kind of unlovely, unlovely? They're hard to love. They're prickly. How do you love someone like that? I think the apostle Paul gives us the key here. For God is my witness, he says. Okay, listen to me. There are people that are hard to love. I, I'll just be honest with you. Uh, I love you, but I don't like all of you. I'm being funny about that. But here's the thing. How do we do it? I've, I've caught myself in the trap sometimes. I don't know if you're like me or not, but I've caught myself in the trap where someone is just so annoying. And all of a sudden... I'll, I'll let something slip past my lips, across my tongue, and I'll say something unloving about somebody who's just annoying. Anyone ever been caught there? James actually addresses this subject and says, the tongue is a small item, like a rudder of a giant ship. Who can tame it? He talks about who can tame the tongue. And you know what's really funny to me? I'll let that happen. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will say, well, that was very unloving of you, Mark. I know, I'm sorry, God. And God is trying to perfect something in me. And I want you to think about this. When God sees you, I want you to think about this. When God sees you, and by the way, how many of us deserve it? None. None of us. It's only by the grace of God that we're in. When God sees you, how does he see you? Does he go, you despicable, unloving, dumb idiot? Is that how God treats you? Or does God look at you and go, my sweet child who belongs to me through my son, Jesus Christ, who gave his blood for you. How does God see you? Do y'all see this? Well, if God can see me that way, perhaps I ought to see that annoying person by the witness of Christ about how they will become and not how they are right now. And that'll help you to love them because God wants to perfect a good work in them too. Is that good? So we are an affectionate people, loving people, kind people. And when we're not, we all let the Holy Spirit correct us. Are y'all good? Okay, here's the next one, Christian affection. Number six, Christian activity. So what are we supposed to be doing right now? What's our activity? What do we need to be thinking about? Okay, watch this. Look at verse nine. Again, we're still talking about love. He says, and this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more. In other words, that Christian affection that you're having for one another, it should be growing. Listen, I love people more today than what I used to. I'm hoping that in the future I love them even more. But it needs to be abounding, how? More and more. Listen, if you're becoming more and more unloving, if you're becoming more and more hateful, I might question where my position is with Christ. Because I want to tell you this, there are a lot of prejudice and things like that that have to go away within the Christian. Amen. Come on now. Y'all know that's right. We love more and more. But 
notice what he says. He says more and more in real knowledge and in all discernment. Do you know it's possible to love people the wrong way? In other words, you can love someone without knowledge and be wrong in your love. And you can love someone without discernment and be wrong in your love. Uh, the, the best example I know of this is, you know, you got that guy who's on the street corner who's got a piece of cardboard that he cut off the top of a box and he wrote a, a shame and guilt statement on the cardboard. It says, we'll work for food. God bless you. Come on, am I the only person who's seen that guy? I thought he was on every street corner now. And so we can think to ourselves, I'm gonna hit some of you with this. Some of you, we can think to ourselves, well, it's love if I pitch a dollar to him or pitch a quarter to him. Okay, that's not love. I'll make this very clear to you, okay? Uh, by the way, we'll work for food. Three businesses right behind him have help wanted signs. Okay, it's not loving if we're enabling them to stay where they are. So you have to love someone with knowledge and discernment to really truly love somebody. Do y'all follow that, what I'm saying to you? By the way, I want to say something about your church. You may not know this about us. We, we, one of our values, core values of our church is generosity. We believe in generosity. God's called us to be a generous church. We love being generous with people. And by the way, uh, people do get into need. There are time to times where things just get hard. And by the way, we love our church family the most. And we love to be generous with our church family the most. But we'll help anybody who needs help. I want you to get that. But we'll do that generosity with love, with knowledge and discernment. So if you come to us and you say, hey, pastor, will you help us? Listen, we're a generous church. We love to help people. But we are not about handouts. We're about hand ups. We'll help you temporarily so that you can get back on your feet so that you can get out and do the right thing in this world. And so we're, the first thing we're gonna ask you is say, hey, we have a form, we'd like for you to fill this out. It's multiple pages long. Why do we need that information? Because we're trying to get knowledge about where you are to know how we can best actually help you and to keep from enabling you to stay where you are. I don't want you to stay where you are. I want you to be able to get on your own two feet and be able to walk. Uh, let me give you a, an example of that. Here's a scriptural passage about that. You may remember Peter and John walked into the temple and there was a man sitting by the temple gates. The gates were called beautiful. And as they were walking into the temple gates, he was begging for money from them. Peter says, silver and gold I do not have. Let me just make a statement to you. It wasn't that Peter didn't have some finances. I don't think that, I think Peter had to have some financing somewhere. He may not have had them with him in the moment, but what he's simply saying is, silver and gold I do not have for you, but what I do have for you, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He gave him the opportunity through discernment and knowledge to be able to take care of himself from that day forward. By the way, I'm just telling you, it's not real love if we're enabling a person to stay where they are. Are y'all getting this? By the way, there's some people today who, well, if you just love us, if, here's what they're actually saying. They don't want you to love them. They want you to love their sin. I can't love your sin. God never called us to love your sin, but listen to me. I love you, and I love you enough to help you to get out of the sin that you're in with knowledge and discernment. Are y'all good with this? So this is Christian activity, learning to love people with knowledge and discernment. And then here's the seventh thing. We'll close with this, Christian accomplishment. How do you know that you've accomplished everything God wants you to accomplish? I think there's some markers that help us to know what they are. And Paul tells us to them in verse 10. He says, all of this I've told you, verses one through nine, I've told you so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Here's the four markers that I see that help you to know if you're living in Christian accomplishment. How do I know that I'm being successful? How do I know that I'm accomplishing what God's called me to? The first one is that if you'll do these things, the things that we've already talked about, all these distinguishing marks of a Christian, 
There'll come a moment where you'll realize that you're able to approve the things that are excellent. Uh, I believe that wisdom is available to every believer. The Bible says, do any of you lack wisdom? Let him ask of God who gives liberally, generously of wisdom. Wisdom is available to you. And if we'll begin to act like what we see in these distinctives, God will provide for you wisdom so that you can go, you can approve of what's excellent. You can go, yes, that's the Lord. Yes, that's God. Yes, this is God's direction for my life. You begin to walk, literally, not just, not just live life, but suddenly you're able to approve the things that God says, this is a more excellent way. This is the right path that you need in your life. To approve what is excellent. The second thing he says is how you know that you're beginning to move. And by the way, if you're starting to operate in wisdom, you can go, I'm starting to walk in the Christian accomplishments that God has for me. The second thing is, he says, sincere. He says that you, in order that you might be sincere and blameless. This word sincere is such a really interesting word. We can actually look in the Latin to see what it means in Latin. And we can also look at what it means in Greek. So in Latin, it means without wax. In Greek, it means sun-proved. Let me help you with that just a little bit. In that day and time, there were a lot of scams that were going on. Sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? And God's saying, I don't want you to be a scam artist. Here's what they would do. They would make pottery, and sometimes when they would put it in the kiln and they would fire the pottery, it would crack. Every time a piece of pottery cracked, it would be profit lost that they couldn't make money on. So to scam people, they would take wax and they would fill in the crack with wax and clay so they would match the outside look of what they had fire kilned. And then they would try and sell it to you, a cracked pot. Uh, Yesterday, I got up early Uh, It was like 40-something degrees outside, but I knew the sun was coming. And I really wanted to sit outside. So I went and made myself a pot of coffee. I got a porcelain mug out of our cabinet, filled that coffee cup up with coffee, went out on my back porch, set my coffee cup down, got out my Bible, started reading, sitting on the back porch, just enjoying the beauty of the morning. In a few minutes, I reached over to that coffee cup, and I brought it over. And as I brought it over across my lap, a little drip of coffee dripped down onto my pants leg. I thought, well, that's weird. And I looked, and there's a little bit of coffee on the bottom. So I just wiped it off. I thought, huh, I must have gotten a little messy in the kitchen with this thing. Took me a drink of coffee, set my coffee back down on the arm, continued reading. A few minutes later, I picked up the coffee cup again. And when I did, another drip down on my pants leg. I thought, well, that's odd. Thought I wiped that off a while ago. Turned the cup around, and there was a crack on the back side of it, and you could see where the coffee, this white mug, had coffee stains coming out the crack. As the, as the coffee cup cooled off, it stopped leaking. Only when it was warm would it leak. It wasn't sincere. Y'all get that? So sincere means to be without wax, and it also means sun-proved. So if you wanted to know if it had wax, you would take that porcelain or that pottery and you'd put it in the sun, S-U-N, and the heat of the S-U-N, the sun, would melt away the wax. Then you could fill it with something and see the crack. Sunproved. Do you know what God wants from you? He doesn't want you to be an imitation. He wants you to be sincere an imitator of Christ. Do y'all see that? He's not looking for fakes. He's not looking for you to fake it till you make it. Have you ever heard anyone say that? Well, just if you're not you know, living right, fake it till you make it. God's not looking for that. God's looking for someone to be sincere and blameless. And by the way, here's the amazing thing. Only God can give you wisdom to approve what's excellent. Only God can make you sincere. And it only comes by spending more time with him. That's pretty good, isn't it? And then here's the third thing. 
how we know we're accomplishing something. It's really how we know that God's accomplishing something in us. When we can approve what's excellent, when we become sincere and blameless in our life. And the third one is the fruit of righteousness. When we're producing the fruit of righteousness. Galatians 5.22 tells us the fruit of the righteousness is actually the fruit of the Spirit. It's His fruit. And that is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. These are things that he produces naturally. That's not the fruit of humans. I mean, we could, we could probably come up with a list that's the fruit of humankind. But I guarantee it's the opposite of love, joy, peace. It's the opposite of that. So how do I know that I'm living in the accomplishments of God? When the Holy Spirit begins to produce love in you, you used to be unloving about some things, now you're loving when God produces joy in your life, when you used to be nothing but sadness. When, you, when God begins to produce peace in your life in the midst of turmoil and you go, I don't know why I'm happy and I don't know why I have peace, but boy, I sure do have a good God. That's when you know the fruit of righteousness is being produced in you and you can realize you're living in the Christian accomplishment. And then here's the final thing. He says the glory and praise to God. You know, I think there was a time in my life where I was super ambitious of what I wanted to do to accomplish. I'm going to say it the wrong way, but it was true. I really wanted what I could accomplish for God. And it was really more about how I'd be viewed by other people. You know how I know that God's been doing a work in me? I could care less about what I've accomplished. Because I know in the end, it was never Mark Allen. But it was God who was doing something in me to the praise and the glory of God. That's how you know. When you get to a place where it's like, I don't really care what people think of me anymore. All I really care about is that God loved me so much that he chose me to accomplish something for his kingdom. And by the way, as a believer, it's not for pastors. It's for believers God wants to accomplish something amazing in you and you'll know that you're living in Christian accomplishment when you can go, it was all the Lord. It wasn't me, it was the Lord. How did you have such a good marriage? It was the Lord. How did you have such good kids? It was the Lord. How did you, how were you able to make it through that job that you have? It was the Lord. How did you make it in your marriage? It was the Lord. That's when you go, God's doing something good in me and I can trust him. Can I pray for you today? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What's God saying to you? Would you take a moment with your head bowed and your eye closed, just say to the Lord, what are you saying to me? God, what are you saying to me? If you're here today and you've never met Jesus as your Savior, maybe what God is saying is, come to me. Come to me. I told this story in the first service, and I almost didn't tell it, but I feel like I need to tell this story. Last weekend, I was in Dowhart. Uh, Die Heart, Texas at New Life Church preaching there and the pastor asked me if I would come and speak on finance speak on money and uh, so anyway I told him I would we went up there so I preached a message on money and on faith that was my whole message and this is how you know God showed up got to the end of that message and God really did bless they actually they took up a miracle offering they said they take once a year they do this miracle offering they take up to do something significant for the kingdom of God. And so there were probably, my guess is probably less than 100 people that were there that day. And less than 100 people raised $116,000. That's pretty powerful. But that's not the good story. Here's the good story. Got finished preaching, went down to the front, was standing on the front row. And a bunch of people, I mean, they just lined up to come talk to me. God had really worked, did a miracle work in a lot of people's lives that day. And they just started talking to me about this is what God's done. I'll tell you some of these stories as we go forward, but it's really incredible. 
I see this young girl just standing back about 10, 15 feet from me over on my left. And I've got like super good peripheral vision. So I can, I, I can see her, I'm looking this direction and I can see her standing right over here. And I know, Holy Spirit speaking to me, you need to talk to this young lady. But I mean, there's a line of people coming to talk to me and I, I can't get to her and she's not stepping closer. So I can't get her into the moment where I can talk to her. And finally, I'm just praying, God, please don't let her walk away. Help me to notice if she walks away so that I can like get her attention because there's something I need to talk to this young lady about. I don't know what it is, but there's something. Finally, the people cleared away and I stepped over and I said, hey, thank you so much for waiting so patiently. I really feel in my spirit that God's telling me I needed to talk to you today. What's going on? And big old tears begin to stream down her face. And the only word she can get out is she says, I'm an atheist. I'm thinking, not anymore. She says, I said, God's talking to you right now. That's a funny statement to make to an atheist. God's talking to you right now. She goes, I don't know, something's happening. I don't know what's going on. I gave her a real simple plan of salvation. I told her about Jesus. I said, would you like to pray and invite Christ in your heart? She goes, I, I just don't, I don't know how this works. I said, it's just faith. You just say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. She said, yeah, I'd like to do that. And we prayed together and I showed her how to invite Jesus. And she prayed this simple prayer and invited Jesus to come into her heart. I had my eyes closed. She had her eyes closed. She had tears streaming down her face as she says, Jesus, come into my heart. Save me from my sins. Thank you that you love me so much. I opened my eyes at the end of that prayer. And I look and this little grandmother has made her way behind her granddaughter. And tears are streaming down her cheeks. Because her daughter, her granddaughter, who's an atheist, came to know Jesus. Okay. I... I introduced her. There was four or five people standing around. I said, hey, you need to get to know Aurora here. I want you to pray for Aurora. Would you reach out to Aurora this week? Hey, could you help find her a Bible this week? That's a Christian association. That's Christian friends. We got her plugged in right there. And then I said this to her. Uh, you know, I, I said, hey, listen, I want you to know I'm praying for you. I'm looking forward to coming back one day. And I want you to come back and tell me your story about what God did. Because your story is not over. It's just begun today. She walked away. The pastor walks over to me. He goes, you don't know who that was. I said, her name was Aurora. He says, no, you don't understand. When she was 10 years old, her dad committed suicide in front of her. She swore at 10 years old that she would never give her life to God because there couldn't be a God who would let her dad do that. Three years later, her grandmother, who was standing behind her weeping, attempted to commit suicide in front of her. And she said, They'll never, I'll never give my life to God. He said, this is only the second time in her life she's been in church. <laughs> and today, when you preach the money message, <laughs> you know that's God. She gave her heart to Jesus. Let me say something to you. You may be here today, and you might be just like Aurora trying to figure this thing out. Listen to me. Why don't you come to Jesus? In just a moment, we're going to have a team of people here at the front. And if you need prayer for any reason, struggling with something, having a hard time, having a health issue, maybe you don't know Jesus, come put your hand for in God someone's hand so and see what God can do. Father, we love you and we bless you. Thank you for every decision made in this room today. Whosoever believes will not take. We love you, Lord, and we bless your name. Come on, let's stand and sing this song together. If you need prayer, come on, we want to pray for you.